Hi, I want to consider doing the following problem. Uh, this is a problem we did in class, uh, but I want to spend a little bit more time on it here. Um, suppose we have a long solenoid of radius r, and there's a time-dependent current moving through the solenoid, and we'll call it i as a function of t. What we want to do is we want to look at the induced EMF and the induced electric field inside the solenoid. We want to look at the force on a charge at this location and we want to talk about uh, the field outside the solenoid. So picture is drawn on the board there. So I have a solenoid that I've drawn and I've indicated the direction of current with the green arrows and I drew it such that the magnetic field points to the right. If I place an actual loop of wire of radius r inside the solenoid, there is an induced uh, EMF inside the loop of wire. And it's determined by the time rate of change in magnetic flux through the loop. Now whether we use a real loop of wire or an imaginary loop of wire, the field exists regardless. By placing a loop of wire, a real wire, real loop of wire inside here, all it does, it gives a path for electrons to go through. So if I draw a loop of wire, or an imaginary loop, like that, and let's say we have a loop of wire of radius r less than big R. Okay, that, that could be a real loop of wire or just an imaginary loop of wire. It doesn't matter. Again, if I put a real loop of wire there, then you have something with the electrons in it, and the electrons will move around uh, in a circle. And of course, there's going to be induced EMF in that. So we, we understand that we have an induced EMF if the current varies with time, because if the current varies with time, the magnetic field varies with time because we know that the magnetic field to a solenoid is mu naught n, where n is the number of turns per unit length, times i. What can we say about the induced electric field? What can we say about the characteristic of the induced electric field? Uh, before I say that, I can easily calculate the induced EMF here. Okay. But what can I say about the field? Well, this field will exist in the absence of any charges, and this field is not conservative. This induced EMF, this induced voltage, which is the work done per unit charge, can be written in the following manner. Take the integral around a closed loop of the induced electric field dotted with dl. When we did electrostatics, this electric field was static, this integral was zero. In this particular case, this integral is not zero. The work per unit charge in the closed path is not zero. I'll write that down. Okay. So let's say some things about the electric field in this case. 
This electric field exists in the absence of, char of charges. So if you have an electric field that exists without any charges, if we integrate the electric field, over a closed surface, in the absence of charges, this would have to be zero. And this is the induced field. We call this field divergentless. And then the other property of this field is that the integral around a closed path is not zero. If you compare it to the properties of the magnetic field, they're similar. In fact, this is from this is really Ampere's law, right? This is because magnetic fields circulate. Magnetic fields form closed loops. Well, guess what? This forms closed loops too. Now, what can we say about the direction of the induced electric field? A lot of us will just say, oh, by symmetry, this is true. But let's try to get a little bit, uh, say a little bit more about the direction of the induced field. So, one direction could be in the radial direction. We can, we, can, we can say, what if the induced field's in the radial direction? Well, I'll think about what that would mean. So let me draw a coordinate system. The radial direction is this direction. What would that mean if I had an electric field that's radial? Now consider, this is a cylindric symmetric system. And if we had an electric field that was radially outward, this integral then, if I had a component of E that's radially directed, parallel to the normal, to a cylinder that it can draw around the solenoid, this integral would not be zero. Which would mean then, according to Gauss's law, there would have to be some charges there. That would violate Gauss's law. So you cannot have an electric field in this case that's in the radial direction. So no field, no component in radial direction. What if you, you say, well, what if this induced field's in the Z direction, or not in the Z direction, but in the direction of the magnetic field? What if we just guessed and said, what if the magnetic, the electric field that's induced is parallel to the magnetic field? So let's say that E points this way. If I were to have to do this integral, then I would have to choose a loop, for example, since B is uniform, this is going to be uniform too. I would have to choose a loop like this that's in the plane of the board. So I choose a loop that's in the plane of the board that contains this, this field. And of course, if I, if, I, if I do it inside here, if I choose a loop like this, in fact, that integral would be zero if the field is uniform because these two are in opposite directions. But furthermore, if I choose that loop, that loop is perpendicular to the magnetic field. The normal to this loop is perpendicular to the magnetic field. There would be no induced EMF. I could choose maybe I can find a loop maybe that only includes something like this. Maybe I can, I can choose a loop like this, an isosceles triangle, where these two cancel. 
but this one does not. The only problem is, the only problem is that the normal to the loop is perpendicular to the magnetic field. There is no changing flux through that loop. So that means that the induced electric field cannot be parallel to the magnetic field. So no component in the radial direction, no component parallel to B. So what's left? What's left? If I don't have something in this direction, and I don't have something coming out of the plane of the board, what's left? Well, I have something tangent to it. This is called a theta hat direction. This is an azimuthal direction. Okay, it's perpendicular to our hat. That would allow this integral to not be zero, but this integral to be zero over a closed surface. So that means this electric field is going to go basically in a circle. It's going to circulate like the magnetic field does. That's the same mathematical property. In fact, you can show in general, not in this course, but you can show in general that the induced electric field is perpendicular to the magnetic field, the time varying magnetic field. Okay, I'll say that again. It turns out in general that the induced electric field is perpendicular to the time varying magnetic field. But we can deduce that it's, we, we actually deduce that it is that case in here. So the electric field circulates. Now whether it circulates clockwise or counterclockwise, I don't know. I'm just going to guess a direction when I do my integral. And if I'm wrong, I'll get a minus sign in my answer. That's really all I need to do. Okay. I'm just going to guess the direction for the induced fields. Either going to be clockwise or counterclockwise. So how am I going to choose my integration? How am I going to integrate this? I want to calculate the integral of V dot DL and set it equal to this expression. Okay, and that's going to allow me to get the, the field. So let's choose a loop whose plane is perpendicular to B, which is what I did. So the loop, the plane of the loop is perpendicular to B. All right, we chose the plane of the loop perpendicular to B. And we want the normal to the loop parallel to the magnetic field. So I'm going to choose, I'm going to, I'm going to choose the normal to the loop. And remember, there's an ambiguity here because this is an open surface. And really what I'm going to do is use the right hand rule to define my normal to the loop. Okay. My normal to the loop is going to be perpendicular to this plane, but it's, if I use the right hand rule, okay, if I use the right hand rule, I'm integrating this way. Okay, I'm integrating this way. I'm going to assume that the electric field is in the same direction I'm integrating. Okay. 
I'll say that again. I'm going to assume that the electric field is in the same direction I'm integrating. In fact, I'm going to assume that the electric field is in the same direction as the current in the solenoid. Because the, the current in the solenoid is circulating in the same direction as I'm going to be integrating. And if I'm wrong, I'll get a minus sign in my answer. Okay? All right. So, because of the fact that I'm choosing the normal to the loop, parallel to B, this dot product is going to be, uh, the, is going to give me a 1 out of it. I'm going to have this times uh, the unit vector in this direction times the unit vector in that direction. That dot product is going to be 1. And so my integral ends up being pretty easy. I get minus d by dt of the integral of mu naught n i times dA. And these terms are independent of the geometry. So I can pull out a lot of stuff here. And of course, the integral of dA is basically the area of this loop. Okay. The area is defined by the loop. This is the area enclosed by the loop. So let me, let me take it one more step here. The integral of e dot dL is equal to mu naught n i oops, di dt, this is the only time varying term here, and the a doesn't change, that's pi r squared. Since the electric field is in the theta hat direction, It's going to be have the same value for any value of r. Okay, the electric field is going to depend on r because the induced EMF is going to depend on r squared. It's going to be it's going to be radially dependent. The electric field is going to have the same value for any value of r because it only varies, it only goes in this direction. As a result, this integration is going to be easy. Solving for E, I get minus mu naught n r over 2 di over dt. Now, the minus sign is important. The minus sign says that the E induced, and I forgot the subscripts, so let me put the subscripts in. The induced electric field is opposite the time rate of change of the current. The induced electric field is opposite, it opposes the change in current. Better yet, the electric field, since this is proportional to the flux, the, the electric field opposes the change in flux. So when this derivative is bigger than zero, then the electric field, you can see the electric field, there's a minus sign here. When, when, this, when this is bigger than zero, the electric field is, that's induced is opposite the direction of the current. 
So in fact, the induced current, if there was an induced current in the loop, it would go this way. If di dt was less than zero, the minus signs would cancel, and then the electric field and the current that's induced will be in the same direction as the current in the solenoid. So this electric, the induced field and the induced current oppose the change in flux. Because remember, di dt is proportional to the flux. I'm sorry, the IDT is proportional to the change in flux. And that's important. That's going to lead us to Lenz's law, which we'll, we will discuss soon in class. Now, suppose we put a charged particle in this field. If we put a charged particle inside a solenoid, it's going to experience a force in the theta hat direction because F is Q times Z. It's going to experience a force in the absence of charges. This is where Coulomb's law doesn't work. Coulomb's law says if you have a, you have to have charges there. Okay, so it's going to experience a force in the absence of charges. And this force is going to be in the theta hat direction. So you're basically going to get a spiral motion. You'll get a spiral motion for the particle. So the last thing we can, we can do now is say, suppose we want to determine the field outside of the solenoid. Then I would draw a loop. Like so of radius r bigger than the radius of the solenoid. So how does my problem change? Well, the logic is still the same. All the logic is still the same. The only thing that changes is my integration. And the only thing that changes in my problem is my integration. Okay, so if I want to, if I want to do this problem for r bigger than, little r bigger than big r, Everything will stay the same except for my integration. The magnetic field is all confined within this radius. The magnetic field out here is zero. So when I calculate the flux through this loop, the flux is all contained within the area of the solenoid. So this area here is going to be the cross-sectional area of the solenoid. So what's going to change here is we're going to have this guy change from this to that. This guy's going to change from this to big R. And so the electric field outside the solenoid will actually decrease as 1 over R. And we'll get the following. We'll get the following expression. And again, the direction of the field is in the azimuthal direction. It would be, in the, we will call it the theta hat direction. I think that's what you learn in physics 205, that that's the theta hat direction. Okay, so the only thing I changed when I did this for r bigger than r was I just changed the uh, integration limits here. And, the, and again, the reason why is because the, the field is confined within the solenoid. There's no field outside the solenoid. So there's no reason to integrate all the way up to this radius because there's no flux going through this part of the loop, which I should draw in better.
So I hope that the description of this problem here, it's a more complete description of this problem here, helps to better understand this problem. All right, thank you.